Last week, if you were with us, I waited until the very end of the sermon, the very end of the sermon, to give you the main idea of the text. And so I thought that I would kind of make up for that this morning, and I would just give it to you right away. And so this is the big idea this morning of our text. It's on the screen, at least it should be. The coming crucifixion of Jesus reveals two new realities, two new realities that will help us better understand the love of God. Again, the coming crucifixion of Jesus reveals two new realities that will help us better understand the love of God. I've mentioned for the past two weeks that John chapters 13 through 17, uh, in those chapters, Jesus was alone with his disciples. The disciples had gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover festival, and Jesus, of course, had prepared a room for them, the upper room, in which they would celebrate this Passover supper. It was during this meal that Jesus, you recall, washed the feet of his disciples. Having washed the feet of his disciples, he said in John chapter 13 and in verse 14, he says, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to to wash one another's feet. That is, those who follow Jesus are to humbly serve each other. We are to wash one another's feet. We're to care and to serve one another. This means that to live and to follow Jesus is to take to heart the concept or the truth that the greatest among us, the greatest among us as Christians, will be a slave of Christ and will be a servant to one another demonstrated it by Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. And we're not greater than our master. And so if our master washes the feet of another, well, we are then called to care in the similar fashion. In addition to teaching this great truth, it was during the Passover meal and the washing of the disciples' feet that Jesus revealed to the disciples that one of them would be a traitor. And we studied this last week, that one of, one, one of them would be a traitor, and this betrayer was Judas Iscariot, as you know. Judas was one of the 12 apostles, and he served as treasurer for the group. That meant that he kept the money bag. He was in charge of the money as the treasurer. Last week, we studied the way Jesus revealed this betrayer to John the Apostle. While sitting as an honored guest, that is Judas, you remember, was an honored guest at the festival, uh, Judas took a morsel of bread that Jesus handed him. From, he, from the very, he took it from the very hand of Jesus, and it was this exchange in the text that signaled to John and then to us as we're reading that Judas was, in fact, this betrayer. He was going to, again, betray Jesus. Having received the morsel of bread, Jesus excused Judas from the room, saying, what you are going to do, do quickly. That's in chapter 13, verse 27. With these words, Judas left the room, and uh, the initial reverberations of Jesus' death had been sounded. The, The ripple effects, you might say, were set in motion, and there would be no turning back. Jesus would indeed be crucified. This is why Jesus says in John chapter 13, verse 31, now, he says, is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. And then he says at the end of verse 32, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. So that idea of now and at once is a clue. What Jesus is saying is that now that Judas is gone, well, the inevitable is going to come. That Jesus will suffer and die. The last barrier, you might say, of Jesus' impending hour, the hour of his death, has been removed. However, Jesus does more than speak of Judas's departure in these verses, in verses 31 and verse 32 there. Jesus speaks of glory. He speaks of glory. He speaks of his own glory and of the glory of the Father. I told you that the coming crucifixion reveals two new realities that will help us better understand the love of God. That was our thesis this morning, the big idea. Well, the first new reality is found in verses 31 and 32, and it's this. It's a new form of glory, a new form of glory. That's the first new reality. I think it's fair to say that the word or the concept of glory is an abstract one. It's an abstract concept. 
It's partly because the word has a couple different aspects, two primary aspects when you think about the word glory. First off, think of the verse, popular verse that we know, Romans 3.23, which says, For all have sinned, you know this verse, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, what does glory mean in that verse? What does glory mean in the verse that says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? If you were to replace that word with something, if you were to use a synonym, what would you use? What verse or what word, excuse me, would you replace it with? For all have sinned and fallen short of the honor, the prestige, the reputation of God. I think these are Probably, it's probably a good solution to the, the problem or the question I've proposed for you this morning. But that's at least the sense of the word glory in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the honor or the excellent reputation of God. And so that's the first sense that glory is used. It's one of honor. However, the Bible speaks of glory in a different sense. For example... Recall the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 16. God promised his people that in the morning they would see his glory. They would see his glory. Well, how do you see honor? How do you see prestige? How do you see an excellent reputation? Well, one theologian put it this way. God's glory is the, revel the revelation of his splendid activity. The revelation of his splendid activity. In other words, God's glory is the visible manifestation of his excellence. And this visible display typically shows up as what? A cloud, a bright light. That's kind of how the glory of God is visually manifested in the Bible. So we see how these two concepts of glory come together through the response of God's people. That is, when the visible presence of God, when the visible presence of God's glory shows up, the people see that which is exceedingly excellent. And those people are prompted to give him glory. That is, give him the honor that he is due. For example, Numbers chapter 20 and verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. They fell on their faces. They, they attributed God honor, and there he was as a bright light, a cloud. His presence appeared to them. And so what does that have to do with John chapter 13? What does that have to do with John 13? Well, look down again at verses John thir uh, chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. And when he had gone out, it says, so Judas left. Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him, he says, at once. Well, first off, you've got to see that the word glory there, the form of the word glory, is used five times in this verse. Jesus uses it, again, five times. So in what sense is Jesus using the word glory in these verses? Is the sense that of honor? Is Jesus speaking of honor, or is he speaking of the visible, visible presence of glory? Well, the answer, of course, is yes, <laughs> right? It's yes. I believe Jesus has both aspects of glory in mind in this verse. He's using both, both uh, senses. He's putting them together in a way, of course, because it's Jesus, in a way never uh, thought possible before. And so in this way, Jesus is speaking of, as I said, a new form of glory, a new form of glory, you see, as I mentioned in the Old Testament, the glory of God appeared in the form of a bright light or as a cloud. Ezekiel 10, you can write down, when, the, when, the, when God's glory leaves the temple in Ezekiel 10, when it departs from the temple, it's a cloud that moves out of the temple. God's glory departed from the temple. But how does the glory of God appear in the New Testament? 
How is the honor and prestige and excellent reputation of God displayed in visible form in the New Testament? Did did I hear anybody say Jesus? (laughs) Right? Through Jesus. Exactly. Jesus is the visible manifestation, the visible display of God's glory. And so when we come to the New Testament, there's no bright lights maybe at the birth of Jesus, but there's no bright lights, there's no clouds, because we have the person of Jesus Christ. We have glory incarnate. And so, Jesus is the glory of God, and yet his glorification, that is, the moment in which his glory is displayed, appears to be the very opposite of glory. It appears to be the very opposite of glory. We would expect something like we see in the Old Testament, something like Psalm 24, 7, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Or something like Psalm 57, 5, be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. This is what we would expect from glory and the glorious one. But that's not the kind of glorification that Jesus is speaking of in these verses. Jesus is looking at the cross as he speaks of glory. As the ancient writer Origen called it, his humble glory. His humble glory. And while it seems that the cross forces together two ideas that are incompatible, namely the cross and glory or shame and honor, or punishment and exaltation. These concepts are not incompatible with God. In fact, there is no place that more clearly demonstrates the honor and glory of Christ than the cross. At the cross of Jesus Christ, we learn more about God's excellence than in any moment in history. In the death of Jesus We see God's holiness and his love. We see his righteousness and his mercy, his justice and his grace, his sovereignty and his humility, his wisdom and his patience. If mankind is to study God, his study must begin where? With the cross. It must start with the cross and it must end with the cross. If we want to understand anything about God, anything, we have to go to the cross. If we want to be changed, what transformation could there ever be outside of the death of Jesus? Furthermore, a crossless Christianity is a godless Christianity. It's no wonder that some of the cults shy away from the cross. Find a cross among the Jehovah's Witness. Find a cross among the Mormons. There's no cross. It's a godless Christianity. We call it that. Why else would we sing, lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. Furthermore, the cross is more than a symbol. It's where our worship begins What does all this mean this morning? What does it mean for us? Well, commenting on this passage, Matt Carter and Josh Renberg, they write this. It's helpful. God will never seem distant. God will never seem distant when we're standing on the hill where his son was sacrificed in our place. How could God be distant? He died for you. They continue. True, passionate worship springs from a heart that has been gripped by the grace of God displayed on the cross. In those seasons of life when we're struggling, make frequent daily pilgrimages to the cross. The cross is not the starting line we, quick, we quickly leave behind, they write. The cross is grand central station, and every part of our life runs from it. What these authors are saying is that the cross is not a mere trademark. It's not a kind of hoop we jump through and we quickly leave behind. 
The cross is our home base. It's the spring of resources. It's the hub of the wheel. The cross is our message and it's our mission. I want to explain that a little bit. The cross is our message and it's our mission. What do I mean when I say that the cross is our message? Well, I simply mean that the cross is the most important information that we wish to communicate. It's the most important information in the world. There is no more important information as a church and as individuals than Jesus' death on the cross. Or what we might call, using this passage, his cross glory. His cross glory. If we were writing a paper, the glory of the cross would be the thesis of our paper. It would be the central idea that we're after as a church and, again, as individuals. Every argument, every illustration, every activity, every event exists to communicate the information of the cross. That's why we're here. The cross is our message. No offense, but we're not the Red Cross. It's more than that. I don't know what you'd replace it with. We're the glory cross. It's a message. Paul, of course, is our greatest mentor in this. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 3. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel, the good news I preached to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For, he says, I delivered to you of first importance, of first importance, what I also received, that what? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Of first importance. That Christ died for our sins. The message of the cross is central. We don't put the cross in the background. We don't bury it in some statement of faith. The cross is not like some piece of china to be stored away in grandma's hutch. No. The cross is like the lazy Susan at grandma's house. It's always out there on the table. It's always there to be turned and moved, to be touched. The apostle again, apostle Paul again, demonstrates the centrality of the cross. He ended there in 1 Corinthians 15, but he also began there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 through 5. I think this is actually the only... For Two verses here. I'm not going to read all of it. But Paul writes, And I, when I came to you, Corinthians, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. He says, For I decided to know nothing among you except what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. The cross. That's where he starts when he goes to Corinth, when he writes to them, and that's where he ended. The cross of Jesus Christ. But as I said, the cross is not only our message, it's our mission as well. It's our message and our mission. Now what do I mean when I say the cross is our mission? Well, the cross tells us what to do. That's what I mean. The cross tells us what to do. Think about it. If the cross is the only means, the only way, through which man can experience the benefits of heaven, then how can it not inform our mission? It's the only means. It's the only means. Let me be very direct. The only way in which people, the people that you love, the only way the people that you love will not suffer eternal torment in hell is if they accept the message of the cross. That's a reality, a stark reality. This means your friends, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers, anyone or anyone who, or everyone, excuse me, who refuses to trust in the cross work of Jesus will suffer, will be thrown in, as Jesus said, the fiery furnace. And in that place, Jesus says, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
It's a terribly unpopular message. It is a terribly unpopular message in our day to talk about eternal torment. We hide that away, do we not? Nobody wants to talk about that. But that's the truth. The people that you love that do not know Jesus will suffer eternal torment. And so how can the cross not be our mission? There's nothing of more importance than telling your friends and neighbors and the people that you love, Jesus saves. It's a stark reality. What does Jesus say? Matthew 26, 19. Go, therefore, make disciples. It's a mission. The mission of the cross is not come and see. That'd be a lot easier, right? Just put a flag out. Come and see what we're doing at church on Sunday. That's not the mission. The mission is go and tell. Go and tell people about this Jesus that you love and about his cross work, the glory of his cross. That's our mission. That's our call. The church isn't people in a place. Understand this. The church is not people in a place. The church is people in places. That's the church. That's what we're called to be, and that's what we're called to do. The church is out there. It's you on mission for Jesus. If you're waiting for an evangelistic program, you're waiting around for training, show, be shown how to, I don't know, do something, some program, you're going to be waiting a long time. Don't wait for that. There's no program in the Bible. The program is just go tell your neighbors about Jesus. That's the program. We can give you tools. We can help you. The cross is the message and the cross is the mission. Now, before we move on, I do want to look at those verses again. Chapters 13, verses 31 and 32, just to review, to make it clear as possible here. Uh, again, now is the Son of Man glorified, Jesus said, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once, Jesus says. Now, what I want to make clear is that when Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and he speaks about glorification in these verses, he is speaking about the crucifixion. I just want to make that very clear. That's what Jesus is speaking about. In John's gospel, the glorification of, of Christ is equal to his cross. The cross is his glory. And if the cross is his glory, it only follows that the cross glory is the very source of of our message and the very source of our mission. So then, verses 31 and 32, we learn about a new form of glory. I hope that's clear. And that new form of glory is a humble glory, as we said. It's the glory of the cross, and this is the first of two new realities that the coming crucifixion of Jesus reveals in our passage this morning. In the verses that remain, I want to talk about a second new reality. Not only do we have a new form of glory, but we have a new group of followers, a new group of followers. Look down at verses 33 through uh, 38, and we'll read those together. Little children, Jesus says, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord... Why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. 
although it is very true that the membership, you might say, of the disciples won't change. I mean, Judas had left, and the, they will eventually add or replace Judas with Matthias in the book of Acts. And then, of course, you have Paul, who is an apostle. But the 11 will not change. The membership of the, the apostles or the disciples here will not change. But the, the dynamics of the group will change. They will change very much, in fact. And as a result, Jesus is preparing the men to become, as I'm calling this, a new group of followers, a new group of followers. First off, notice in verse 33, Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot come. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Jesus is speaking about a new journey, a new journey. How many times do the gospels record Jesus saying, follow me? He's always saying that. When he called them, he, he said to each one of them, follow me, follow me. In contrast, Jesus here is saying that he can't, they can't come where he's going. In Jesus' day, of course, to be a disciple of someone meant you followed them wherever they went. That's what it meant to be a disciple. You followed them around. You lived with them. You took on the practices of their life. You modeled every aspect of your life after them. And this the, the disciples had done up to this point. That's what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus. But now here, Jesus is saying this is no longer possible. It's no longer possible. There's somewhere Jesus must go that they can't follow him. They can't follow him. Of course, reading between the lines a little bit, Jesus is saying, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to the cross. And I have to go there alone. So with these words, the disciples' relationship with Jesus is changing. It's a changing kind of relationship. Of course, they're going to still follow his teachings. They're going to obey his commands. All that is true. But he will no longer be with them physically. It's going to be a new kind of journey. Jesus intends to leave them. So to be clear, Jesus only intends to leave for a time. It's a brief amount of time. Look down at chapter 14, verse 3. And if I go, Jesus says, and prepare a place for you, I will come again, he said. I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you will be also. Now, apparently, Jesus intends to only leave for a short time. And as I calculate things, he's only been gone about 2,000 years, which, of course, in Jesus' time is a short amount of time. <laughs> But it feels like an awful long time, doesn't it? Uh, it sure does. But it's only 2,000 years. That's it. Therefore, Jesus' followers have a new journey ahead of them. A new journey. And not only that, but there's a new command. There's a new command given to them. Look again at verses 34 and 35. A new command, Jesus says, I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, that is the love that you have for one another, all people will know that you are my disciples if, again, you have love for one another. The opening words here in verses 34, a new commandment, Jesus is very emphatic there in the original language. That's kind of the stress of the verse. You could underline it. A new commandment, Jesus is saying. He's putting stress on it. Simply signifying that what he's saying is going to be very important, and this is very important. It's a new commandment. It's very important, but yet it's very simple. In fact, these are very simple words. Love one another. Love one another. Now, one of the challenges to interpreting this, maybe a question you have as, as we're reading it and looking at it, is in what sense is this new? What sense is this a new commandment? I suspect that even if you don't know much about Scripture, you would, you would expect that the Bible, uh, if you're new to the faith or you haven't read your Bible a lot, you would suspect that the commandment to love isn't a new commandment, that maybe it, it was earlier than kind of way at the back of the Bible, that somewhere along uh, the course here that God would have told us to love each other. So in what sense is this a new command? Well, first off, you're right. 
the Bible does actually command us to love early on. And so it, it's only in the, chapter, the third book of the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, that we read this. We read the following. This is Leviticus 19.18, by the way. It says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So that's early in the Bible. We have this command to love one another. Furthermore, in the life of Jesus, Jesus has already made this command. He has already taught his disciples, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew chapter 22. So if love itself is not a new command, if love is not a new command, but an old one, why does Jesus call it a new command? Why does he call it a new command? Well, the command is new in the sense that there's a new affection found for one another on account of Christ's love for us. Let me say that again. The command is new in the sense that there's a new affection found for one another on account of Christ's love for us. In his commentary on the book of John, Gary Burge talks about a woman who confided in him While growing up, she had no memory of ever being told, I love you. No one ever uh, shared affection for her growing up. He tells a story about this woman. Her family was cold. There was no spoken emotion. There were very few gestures of um, affection. Maybe you grew up like that. Maybe you've known someone who grew up in a home that way, kind of a, a home with no affection, parents never told you that you were loved, that they loved you. I don't think it takes a psychologist to imagine how such a person might struggle to show affection as an adult. In which case, I think it's a rule that, as Burge writes, quote, unless one has some profound experience of being loved, it's virtually impossible to express express profound love for another. And I think the Bible does seem to suggest such a rule. Passages like 1 John 4.10. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son, of course, to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4.19. We love because he first loved us. 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5.14. For the love of Christ controls us. And so the question again, why does Jesus call the command to love a new command? The answer, once again, the command is new in the sense that there's a new affection found for one another on account of Christ's love for us. The command is new, you see, because there's a new standard, a new demonstration of love has been set. It's as if, all of a sudden, we come to realize as Christians, as believers, that we have been reared in a family with deep love and affection that washes over us when we come to the cross, when we come to Jesus. Well, it seemed for so long that love was so distant, all at once we discover that we have been chosen before the foundation of the world that washes over us, and we realize God has always loved me. I might not have known it, but there was deep love for me even before God spoke the world into existence. He loved me. We come to realize that God has called us by name. Isaiah 43, 1. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, it says. We come to realize that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us. And it's therefore from the overflow of Christ's love for us that we pick up a new command. We pick up a new command. It's precisely because we know the love of God that surpasses knowledge that we love one another. to be more specific about that love. The love of Jesus, the love that Jesus speaks of here, excuse me, is not a love for the world. 
It's not even a love for the unbeliever. It's not what Jesus is talking about here, although it's true. You should love all people. Jesus is calling us to love other believers, other Christians. This becomes very clear in verse 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. In other words, the command of love is a new ethic. It's a new kind of marching order for God's people. And more than an obligation, it's really a privilege. It's a privilege we have to proclaim the truth of God through our care for one another. And before a watching world, the world would know that we are Christ's disciples by the way that we care and we love one another. Way back in the third century, the author Tertullian, he wrote on the topic of persecution, he says, quote, it is mainly the deeds of a love so noble that lead many to put a brand upon us. See, they say, how they love one another. See how they are ready even to die for one another. This is our, this is our Christian heritage, that we, we die for one another. Even when the world persecutes us, mocks us for our beliefs, this quote suggests that the world can't, can't take from us the care and the concern that we have for each other. They might take our lives, but that's all they can take. That's it. They can't take the love that I have for you. They can't touch that. All they can do is take my life. All they can do is take yours. All they can do is mock you. That's it. It's as far as it goes. That's nothing. But they can never take the love that we have for one another. While the world might scoff at what we believe, let them never say that we did not love each other. Let them never say that. That we did not care for one another. Sorry to yell at you. Another thought here in light of the Super Bowl. Tom, this is for you. This afternoon, right, people will gather. They will gather as they share an interest in football. That's good. And just like a Super Bowl party, there are many places that you can go to find community in this world. You can find shared interests. There are many places like that. Many places you can go find shared interest in sports, music, sewing, sorry, cycling, politics. But you see, what makes Christianity, what makes Christians different, is that we're not committed to one another because we share the same interests. At least not primarily. That's not why we're committed to each other. Not at all. You don't have to like the things that I like. We could be about totally different things. I could hate football. You could love it. We don't invest in one another because we have an affinity for the same things. Actually, what's most compelling is when we don't have an affinity for the same things. That's what's most compelling. To use the Super Bowl again, it's not that I'm rooting for the Niners and you're rooting for Taylor Swift. It's that I'm rooting for the Niners and you're saying, who's Taylor Swift? Do you follow me? What makes Christians, Christian love so compelling is that it's not based on anything but the model of Christ. Let me say it another way and I'm going to overstate it to make the point. We don't love each other because we root for the same football team or because we like football. We don't love each other because we come from the same family, because we're from the same denomination, because we have similar backgrounds, because we speak the same language. Sorry. We don't love each other, dare I say, because we agree on the fine points of theology, although those are important. Absolutely, they are very important. But that's not why we love each other. We love each other, it's so simple, first and foremost, because Christ loved us. That's why we love each other. That transcends everything. And so may God make us a church so diverse, so different. And there's no reason we would ever be together in this room except for one reason, the cross of Jesus Christ. 
Let's make the gospel central. Gary Burge again, quote, It is the mandate of the church to become a community of love, a circle of Christ's followers who invest in one another because Christ has invested in them, who exhibit love based on the shared, based on the shared idea or feelings or who exhibit love not, excuse me, exhibit love not based on the shared ideas or feelings or attractiveness of its members, but on the model of Christ, who, of course, you remember just weeks ago, washed the feet of his disciples, even the feet of the traitor. So then, we have a new group of followers, a group of followers that are in a new journey. Jesus will no longer be with them, will no longer be with us, We've been given a new commandment to love one another based on the cross of Christ. And there's one final dynamic to this new group of followers, and it's found in verses 36 and 38. There's a lot we could say about Peter here, but we just kind of hit some of the high points or just focus on one thing here. But again, verses 36 through 38, Simon Peter said to him, to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. But you will follow, he says, afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Simon Peter asked the obvious question. Back up in verse 33, remember, Jesus said, yet a little while, little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to you, to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. So Jesus is telling them, you can't go where I'm going. So Peter asks the natural question, where are you going? Where are you going? Jesus tells Peter that he can't follow him. Peter replies, verse 37, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you, Peter says. Of course, there's rich irony in these words. We can feel it in Jesus' res response to Peter. Will you lay, lay down your life for me? Of course. The irony is that in just a matter of hours, Jesus will be laying down his life for Peter, and Peter will be doing what? Denying Jesus. He will be denying his allegiance to Christ. And so even before the rooster crows in the morning, as Jesus tells us there, Peter will have denied him. Take a closer look at verse 36. I want to kind of just focus on that verse here. Jesus answered him, where I am going, he says, you cannot follow me. He says he cannot be followed. Jesus can't be followed. It's clear from Peter's words that he desires to follow Jesus. He wanted to follow Jesus. Yet Jesus says he's unable. Why? Why can't Peter follow Jesus? Jesus? Well, one answer is simply that Jesus was about to go somewhere that no one else could follow. No one could follow him where he was going to go. He was going to endure something that no one else could endure. He was going to the cross where God's holy wrath against sin would be laid upon his shoulders. And so in this sense, there's absolutely, it's absolutely true that Peter cannot follow Jesus. In that sense. The problem, however, with this answer, if that's what Jesus means, at least in my interpretation here, is that the problem is, is that in verse 36, Jesus actually says, but you will follow me afterward. You will follow me afterward. As I see it, these words, but you will follow me afterwards, or afterward, reveal that Jesus isn't implying that Peter can't follow him because he can't shoulder the spiritual task. I don't think Jesus is really referring to the cross here in these verses. Rather, I think Jesus is alluding to a kind of power that Peter was lacking. He lacked the ability to follow Jesus in this moment. And so Peter can't follow because in the moment, he doesn't have the spiritual power required to follow. But all of that will change that's why Jesus says, afterward, you will be able to follow me. And so as it turns out, Jesus' followers, his disciples, are on a new journey. They have been given a new command. And finally, his disciples will have a new power. 
They'll have a new power. As we'll see in the weeks to follow, one of the major themes of the next chapter is the Holy Spirit. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that Peter and the disciples will be able to follow Jesus. For example, if you just look over at chapter 14, verses 15 through 17 there, if you love me, Jesus says, this is 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit will come and the indwelling spirit will be in Peter's life and it will drastically change Peter's ability to follow Jesus. Drastically change our ability, amen, to follow Jesus. So the prophecy of Peter's denial and Peter's inability to follow without the spirit reveals, it reveals our desperate need for spiritual power. You might even say the secret of our safety is a constant dependence on the Spirit. As Paul taught us, walk by the Spirit. You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. These words, walking by the Spirit, didn't apply to Peter before the coming of the Holy Spirit. He didn't have that power. Without the ability to keep in step with the Spirit, he wasn't able to faithfully follow Jesus. And yet, of course, we know anything about Peter's story, he certainly proved that he was able to follow Jesus after the coming of the Holy Spirit. As you know, being filled with the Spirit, Peter became a leader among the apostles. He fearlessly, fearlessly preached the gospel. He wrote two letters in the Bible, and he was martyred for his faith and for Christ. He died, and so in fact, he did follow afterward as Jesus predicted. There's no doubt that Peter was d deeply impacted by the Spirit and by the love of Christ. As he wrote through the inspiration of the Spirit, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 30, 22, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And we are to love in this way because, again, as Peter wrote, we have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, as Peter writes. And so the coming crucifixion of Jesus in these verses reveals two new realities. A new form of glory, the glory of the cross, you might say, and a new group of followers. A new group of followers marked by a new journey, a new command, and a new power. And I hope you can see how these two new realities help us to better understand the love of God. These two realities are grounded on the love of God, for without the deep love of God, there would be neither a cross nor a command to love. It is the love of God and the sacrificial love of Christ that is the supreme standard of Christian love. Love is the distinguishing mark of the Christian. As Jesus said in this passage, by this, all people will know that you are my, my disciples if you have love for one another. And love is not, only the, is not only the distinguishing mark of the Christian. Love is what guarantees, it's what guarantees our future salvation and God's present work in us as we journey forward armed with a command to love and the power to obey it. Peter ended his, ended his second letter with a kind of benediction, I suppose. We could pick this up and take it as our, as our own. He says, let us grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Joel, would you come up? We're going to sing a, a song that is about the love of God here. It's, it's a, kind of a sober song. It's a sobering song, but it is a profound song. And so I just would encourage you to take to heart the lyrics of this song as we sing it together is a wonderful, wonderful song about the love of the Father.